Ain't Too Proud follows The Temptations' journey from the streets of Detroit to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. With their signature dance moves and unmistakable harmonies, they rose to the top of the charts, creating an amazing 42 top 10 hits, with 14 reaching number one. Through friendship and betrayal, amid the civil unrest that tore America apart, their moving and personal story still resonates five decades later. Talking about my girl, my girl. I know you want to leave me, but I refuse to let you go. If I have to beg you, please, for your sympathy, I don't mind, because you mean that much to me. Ain't too proud to beg, as you know it. Please don't leave me, girl, don't you go. Ain't too proud to be. Let's welcome the cast. Thank you so much for joining us Thanks today. Thanks for having us. Having no us problem. That's our first time seeing that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> That's really, really yeah. cool. <laughs> I was over here jamming. <laughs> Everyone take a moment to introduce yourselves. Hey, uh, I'm James Harkness. I play Paul Williams. Good afternoon, I'm Jeremy Pope. I play Eddie Kendricks. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Derek Baskin. I play Otis Williams. And hey y'all, I'm Juwan Jackson. I play Melvin Franklin. So again, thank you again for being here. I mean, this trailer tells the story of it all. Um, the Temptations have been successfully active for since the 1960s. And um, how important or relevant is the show for audience today considering the musical landscape? I think it's incredibly relevant today. Um, one of the things that I love about, there's so many things that is great about this story. Um, one of the things is that it took them a minute before they hit number one. And right now we're in a time where social media plays such a huge part of everyone's lives and everything is almost instantaneous. And you have these kids that are coming out and they have like 13, thousand followers or more and they think that it's gonna happen right away and it doesn't really happen right away to get something that's really great and something that's gonna last and as you know about the temptations their music has lasted all of these years and it is still incredibly relevant and it is still and it's timeless but it took them a second to get there and I think that's something very important for people to understand about them absolutely what about their personas really drew you into these individual roles. Um, I grew up listening to The Temptations. Uh, my parents would always play The Temptations album, the Christmas album specifically, and that's how I knew that it was time to trim the Christmas tree, you know, and get it ready. <laughs> Christmas was now upon us. Um, but I think what I've learned um, through the show and working on this piece is just um, the struggles and the sacrifices these men, um, the things they had to go through, you know, their music was in the middle, smack dab in the middle of the civil rights movement and it charged that movement and what it must have felt like to, you know, be wanted as an artist, but for, you know, who you are and the color of your skin to, not, to be denied of that. You know, they were performing for segregated audiences and I can only imagine what that um, felt like. Um, must have felt like and just the the questions 
issues and things they had to go through as individuals. Um, but to kind of see on the end, you know, now we're able to, they have granted us an opportunity to c continue the legacy right. and to tell the story of these incredible um, men. Um, and we get to humanize them and talk about, you know, the, the good times, but also their, their, their ugly truths. Right. Um, and I think that is beautiful. That is the beauty of what it is that we're doing. Yeah, I think that that was something that resonated with me when I saw the show is that ugly truth that mm -hmm. it wasn't just all stars and lights, but yeah. actual real life happening during a, such a, a time of unrest. For sure. Um, how did each of you prep for taking on your individual roles? Uh, I, can, I can start with that. Um, I'm born and raised in Detroit, so I think this is a thing that's been, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 313, through and through. Um, <laughs> and so growing up in this music, I think, you know, once once it came about, I've always wanted to play, you know, um, Melvin Franklin and just somebody that is not highly represented in my um, vocal category, you know. And so I only had growing up, you know, uh, Michael McCrae from Boys to Men. You had um, Lou Rawls, Barry White, and then Melvin Franklin, who's, you know, the epitome of basses, you know, in, in, in R&B. And so, you know, this is just a character study. And I, I, I took my time and I did my research. And, you know, my cousin dated Melvin when I was, you know, and I have a story <laughs> about that. And so. You hold it now. I didn't know. No, I've always told that story. I've always told that story. My cousin dated oh, when they were in high Right. School. Really? Yeah, they went to the same high school together. Yeah. And she's like, you know, I dated Melvin for a while. <laughs> <laughs> he was always, I could never keep him up because everybody was always over him. So I was like, okay, I don't want to hang. <laughs> so, Melvin could have been my cousin, but. You know. right. <laughs> but so it's just, you know, that, I think Melvin's been a part of me in my life, you right. know, for so long. So it's just easy to, once the role came. But we also, like, this show for all of us, it's a marathon. You know, it, it really is a very uh, taxing show on your body, on your spirit, on your soul. Right. So uh, uh, practically, we have to, like, I have to go to the gym every day. I have to work out. I have to stretch and warm up, but I also have to hydrate. Uh, this is like my third or fourth bottle of water <laughs> since mm -hmm. I, I've woken up. And then I can't just drink water. Now I have to drink coconut water to make sure I have electrolytes and all that stuff. Just And I have to prepare for that now so that by 8 o'clock, I'll be ready to actually do the show. Um, and it, it just takes, it's a lot of upkeep to do this particular musical. But uh, the, uh, the subject matter that we, um, every night that we visit, mm -hmm. it requires us to also be very grounded spiritually. Right. Um, because we are really, really good friends um, off stage and on stage we play brothers essentially and a lot of times, uh, not so much with me and Juwan, but like sometimes with me and Jeremy, mm -hmm. uh, we have to do some very uh, intense scene work right. and uh, we have to make sure that we feel safe with each other mm -hmm. and I can't take it personally when he is yelling at me because it's actually That's not him problem. yelling at me, it's Eddie yelling at Otis. Right. Uh, but but sometimes as an artist, you know, we get really, uh, really entwined with our characters. And um, it, you have to just really be grounded spiritually and emotionally to play such a emotionally and spiritually charged show. So you just have to make sure, you know, whatever I pray, you know, I pray, I read the Bible. I think we all meditate. Uh, I, I got to take up yoga now. <laughs> like, I just need to breathe, you know. It's, it's, it's just a lot to... Uh, it's a lot to deal with, and it's a, a big responsibility because um, you really want to honor these guys, you Absolutely. know? You know, they really, we stand on their shoulders. They've paved the way for us, you know? So had Otis Williams not done what he did, I, who am playing him, cannot do what I'm doing. And so it's just a, it's, um, it's a heavy responsibility, but it's also a blessing. True. So we have to prepare and each way that we can, in every way that we can, so that we can really honor these guys every night. Well, speaking of physicality and just um, well-being, um, Efren Sykes is not here. Yeah. Um, he's resting his voice. But what do each of you do? What are your regiments to kind of like make sure you stay um, in the best shape possible? Starting with you, Jeremy. Um, well, I have. <laughs> 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 a lot of things. <laughs> no, I think I, I give it up to my voice, my vocal coach, who I've been um, working with intensely this season, Liz Kaplan, who has just helped me uh, stay grounded. And I think 
uh, my whole big thing this season, and I say the season in us joining and doing this marathon of a show, is just no stress. I feel like when you stress, that's when your body wants to break down and your voice gets tight. And um, you know, I'm only in control of the things I can control. Mm -hmm. And I do hold the responsibility of how important this show is. And I know that I have to show up for the show every night because I know that I'm being used. Mm -hmm. It feels like when we're on stage, it's not about Jeremy Pope or Derek Baskin. It feels like it's the higher calling and I'm just a vessel. Right. And people are seeing Eddie Kendricks or they're seeing Paul Williams. So it's kind of like you just show up for that and know that the greater good is going to work itself out. So Absolutely. in that, it's just, like Derek said, going to the gym and making sure I'm drinking enough water and just staying hydrated and trying not to stress about things that I can't control. Mm -hmm. um, so that when we get to the show, we huddle up. You know, every time before we go on stage, we hold each other and we just tune in and go, you good? And sometimes the answer is no. And it's like, okay, I got you because I know that I can't do this show without my brothers. I know that I'm not in it alone. Really our whole cast, mm -hmm. you know, we have a prayer circle for people that want to come in. Most of us get in that circle and just breathe. That's what we start with is everyone breathe in and breathe out, breathe yeah. out, yeah. you know, the negative, you know, anything negative, anything that's just not going to help service you to do what you're about to do. Right. Um, so that we can make it to the finish line. And we do every night, you know, and I'm so grateful for these guys. So I know that in my prep, it's stuff that I do at home. It's my vocal lessons, it's my exercising, it's, you know, staying hydrated, but it's also just leaning on these guys and being there for them, mm -hmm. because I know that's a part of the process as well. Yeah. James, talk to us a little bit about the audition process. And I absolutely want to hear from each of you. Um, talk to us about the process, the research, but then also how you got the call and what happened after that. <laughs> uh, well, it was a long audition process, um, it, but it was one of the most fun audition processes I've ever been through yeah. um, because the, there was so much love throughout this whole process. And um, as far as research is concerned, you know, the initial call was for the Detroit project. Okay. So, and we knew it was about the Temptations. So, of course, you know, you're gonna go and listen to whatever Temptations music you can find or go surf YouTube and find out any mm -hmm. videos. But, you know, you have to also have to just open yourself up to whatever the process is gonna be when you walk into the room. Right. So for me, the first thing was, it was a dance audition. It was a huge dance audition. Now, mind you, um, I, talked my way into the audition. I okay. actually, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was never called in for this process. Um, a lot of people got, were invited through their agents or managers or whatnot. I was not. And uh, the day before the show that I was doing at the time, all the other guys were going in and one of them turned to me and it was like, are you going to this audition tomorrow or not? And so I went, <sighs> I picked up my phone I sent a text message to Sergio Trujillo, who is our choreographer, and I just said, hey, it's been a minute since we've spoken, and um, I know you're doing this Temptations thing tomorrow. I would love to be in the room, but I also understand if not. And a minute later, I got a message back saying, please come. Mm -hmm. So I came. And uh, I mean, here I am sitting. Nah. So <laughs> it, 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 did all, good, it all worked friend. out. Most important. I mean, but it was a long but incredible process. One of the things I loved about auditioning for this show, yeah. as I said earlier, was the love. A lot of times you audition for things, and I don't know. It's not the same as going in on an interview. In an audition room, everyone's in the room and everyone is doing it at the same time, especially in a dance call. Mm -hmm. So you know, every single person, we're all learning the choreography at the same time and we're either in groups of five or more when we audition or, as what happened in this one, Sergio was like, okay guys, we're gonna go one by one. Yeah. And everyone was like, what? <laughs> you know, but, so then you have like everyone's eyes on you right. watching. But what was beautiful about this process is everyone supported each other. That's and I have been auditioning for a while and I have never felt what I felt in the rooms for these auditions. Because everyone was with each other going, Hey, you know, <laughs> giving each other like support and cheering each other on. And if someone didn't really know the step, someone would help the, help the other person out with the step. That doesn't always happen because as you know, a lot of times you're trying to get what you need to get. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of things about this world. You're, a lot of times people go through life going, I need to get where I need to get to. One of the things that's been great also about being in this show, just as Jeremy was saying, mm -hmm. people, we're here to support each other. As it should be. Because you need someone's hand on your back 
at some times. Mm -hmm. You need someone to help guide you forward. Mm -hmm. And that support system, feeling that from the beginning of this process mm -hmm. was amazing. Um, the call, mm. oh yeah. Yes, let's jump, <laughs> let's unpack it. <laughs> Well, there's two calls that are very important through this process for me. So third audition, I had gone in and finally auditioned for Paul. Initially, I went in to dance, and then we sang. And then they gave us sides to learn, which were sides for some of the secondary characters. I went in audition for that. And then the director looked at me, and he said, hold on a minute. He turned to his assistant, and they were like, <laughs> <laughs> And then he rifled through some papers and then he held this out and he said, here, go read for Paul and come back in when you're ready to, to do it. So I went out to the hallway, learned the stuff, came back in and auditioned for Paul. This is my third, uh, third audition. I get back to work. All the guys that were at, that had gotten their callbacks already. So this is about 7 o'clock, 7.15. And no, it was a half hour, 7.30, so sorry, this is about 7.45. <laughs> and they're like, they're like callbacks and they're talking about the stuff and I'm sitting there going, okay, well, all right, yeah. didn't get one. And, uh, but I also went, but I'm okay because the process has been so good right. that if this is where it ends for me, Sucks, yes, because I really, really, really want this. But it's also OK because the process has been so great. Pop, 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 all these messages come up on my phone. And then I see one from my manager. So I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> and it said, hey, buddy, you got your call back. And I was sitting in my chair, and I was like, yes! And I started laughing, and then I immediately started crying. Mm -hmm. And w one, my castmate looked at me, and he was like, are you doing a scene right now? <laughs> and I was like, no. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of famous for doing scenes. <laughs> but then I realized at that moment how bad I really, really wanted it. And because I sat and I cried. But I cried out of joy. And so that was one call. And then the call call was after the last final audition uh, where everyone was in the room. Dominique was in the room. The producers were in the room. Everyone was there. And did that whole audition, was walking back to do my show. I was at, in Beautiful the Musical at the time. I was walking with Clayton. And I found out that Clayton, who plays one of the guys, uh, who plays one of the guys in the show, he's one of our uh, cast members, he was also up for Paul. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that until that moment. And uh, we're walking down the street, and I just went, huh, Clayton. And I was like, great, because Clayton's amazing. Uh, and I went, well, that's where that role is going. Mm -hmm. And I made peace with it the next day. Then I get a phone call, and my manager was like, so how was the audition? <laughs> and I was like, it was cool. He's like, so how do you think you did? <laughs> and I was like, I, the director said I did a good job. So, so, I, he, okay. so I said, OK. <laughs> he fully set me up. Setting you up. And he, was, <laughs> and he was like, so well, I'm sorry to tell you. And I was like, <clears throat> OK, uh, that you'll be doing double duty for the next six weeks. And double duty means I was going to be rehearsing all day and then also doing my shows at night. And I said, well, I can't say what I said <laughs> <laughs> at that particular moment. And then I started crying. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, and Weeping Willow. It's in the dry. Yeah. <laughs> Boo. Uh, so that, that is what happened. Those were the two calls uh, that mean the most to me. And uh, I get to be here. That's wonderful. Yeah. What have you all learned about yourselves um, throughout the process of auditioning, of course, getting the call, but then also playing these real life, bigger, larger than life personas? Well, I honestly didn't know if I was actually capable of doing so much work. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, before this show, you know, I uh, would play like a sidekick. And I'd sing a really cool song, right. and then you know that'd be it. And the show I did before this show, I was a mute, <laughs> so <laughs> I had no lines. <laughs> now go from that to doing like 50 million monologues. It's um, I just didn't. I, I just wasn't sure I was capable of carrying, I guess, so much weight. Um, and 
this show showed me uh, how capable I am of, of trying to rise to a challenge. Right. And um, I think when you're presented with any kind of obstacle or any kind of challenge, and to be able to rise to that, for me, it was just kind of life affirming um, to say, you know, I actually can be stronger than I think I am. And I think a lot of times we have moments in our lives where we're like, I just don't think I'm capable of doing, right. you know, X, Y, or Z. And to be given an opportunity to say, actually, you know what, you're actually stronger than you think you are. Right. Um, I think it taught me that I'm stronger than I think I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there parallels between each of you individually and the characters that, uh, and the real life personas that you're playing? Parallels in their yes. lives? Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say this. So, uh, <laughs> it's, really weird and eerie how each of us are very we're very close to the personas that we play and I don't think I'm certain casting didn't really know it casting the casting directors didn't know it um, but I think we kind of just I think the reason why we all book these roles is where we all are very similar to our characters um, and it's eerie mm -hmm. like f specifically like uh, these two specifically. Um, uh, uh, Juwan has like just a, one of the biggest hearts. Um, he has just a great smile. Um, uh, and, and, and <laughs> he, he is kind of the warmth of our show. Um, and uh, Jeremy, when I first met Jeremy, actually we also went on a uh, we went on vacations together between one of the two dates. We went all the way to Bali. Mm -hmm. And on the trip to Bali, Jeremy is thinking about some business. He was like, all right, now what can I do as an artist to make, you know, what, what, what can I do to help brand the show? You know, can I do anything? I wasn't thinking about the show. No. But, you know, Jeremy, he's very good um, at branding. Mm -hmm. He's very good at um, uh, uh, the business side of things, which I think Eddie Kendricks was also very um, um, interested in, in making sure that artists were taking care of themselves, that artists were taken care of by the record companies. And Jeremy is kind of like our ringleader when it comes to, okay, whoever we're talking to or whoever, wherever we're doing, are you taking care of us as artists? Right. And that's Jeremy's responsibility, which is what, you know, pretty much what Eddie did, I think, with our group. Uh, but this, it's the same with Ephraim, you know. Ephraim has this, like, fire inside of him. I don't think that he's as, he's not actually as dysfunctional as David Ruffin was. Right, right. Um, <laughs> he's, he's actually not, but um, he does have this, um, this fire mm -hmm. um, that, I, that, that I actually admire. Um, and then James as well, you know, you, you, James had talk, told you about, he about cried about three, four times <laughs> in his interview. But like, you know, he is like the heart and the soul. He really is, you know, he wears his heart on his sleeves mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, he has his sensitivity. And so it's just really interesting how just everything that we've gone through in life before we even got to these roles have prepared us for the roles that we are playing. It's really cool the way that uh, yeah. life has paralleled that way. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, speaking of chemistry, you had touched on it earlier. Um, so the show works because you all feed off of each other. What is your favorite song to perform and why? Uh, I'll go first. Okay. Uh, my favorite song that we do in the show, um, I think is My Girl. Um, I think well, I know. It's because it's the first time that the classic five were all on stage together. Right. That we kind of, you know, solidify where the temptations. And I think it's the moment in the show where um, you begin to really hear those classic temptation songs that you know. So as soon as you hear that bass line on My Girl, that's when we hear the audience singing back at us. Right. And they're ready because they <laughs> yeah. know, well, we're about to get into the good, you know, their favorite, favorite, right. favorite temptation song. We're in the show. Um, so that is a moment that I love in the show, um, the most in the song that I love the most. What about you? There's so many. Um, it's been hard to nail this one down. Okay. It really has been. But um, I will say that I love doing Get Ready. Oh, gosh. Um, because it, 
it now we're in Temptations world, and this is also a big hit for the Temptations. Um, but then there's also this interview that happens right, right in the middle of it, and we've been doing a lot of these wonderful interviews. So there are times when I'm also like on stage, and I'm looking at us sitting on stage in this on stage interview, but then I go, but we just did this like earlier today. <laughs> um, and <laughs> so it's a really, really fascinating thing. You know, as he was, uh, Derek was saying, we, we really do like bring these characters to life. We kind of personify these people. And there are so many times when I'm looking at Eddie, I mean, Jeremy. Jeremy. I'm, Jeremy. I'm looking at Jeremy on stage, <laughs> yeah. but I'm seeing Eddie, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing Jeremy. And it just kind of starts to do this, and it's a really, really fascinating It's one of those thing. things, like, I mean, going back to the last one, it's just like you don't really want to talk about it because right. you don't really want to get into You don't want to figure out why that is. Right. It just kind of is. It is. Yeah. And it's scary. Like you said, it's eerie because, like, there's times where I'm, like, looking at Ephraim, who's playing David Ruffin, and it's like you don't want to talk to him because of the fire, like, how messed up it seems, you mm -hmm. know, but there's still this, like, love and where you want to, you know, care for him. And right. I feel that way with each of us, that it's just, it's not us. It's just something else. And we kind of go, like, great, you're, you're acting real well today, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you kind of just, you just leave it at that, you know? Yeah. It, it, oftentimes, too, we'll, we'll get, there's a scene between Derek and I, um, which is, leads me into my favorite song, To Hear, yeah. is just my imagination right before that. And um, sometimes, like, that's the first time Melvin gets mad and upset in the show. And then, like, sometimes he'll go, like, off on me. And then, like, right when we walk into the thing, he's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? like, so I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. Or oh, I roll my eyes like, do it again. Do it again. <laughs> um, but then it leads into just my imagination, which is my favorite number to to listen to because Jeremy Pope just steals the audience. Beautiful. And if it, you know, if you didn't know about his vocal abilities or anything as Eddie Kendricks, or you had questions, they are debunked there because yeah. that boy sings the pan and the draws off of anybody that's <laughs> listening. It's so great. It's Literally. So, like, Literally. Yeah. It's amazing to hear just the, in the stillness. That's the first time I think in the show that we're actually, as Temptations, just still, and you get to just enjoy and listen mm -hmm. and, and be in the moment with us and follow the journey. And so, you know, that's one of my favorite numbers. That's amazing. Speaking of pulling the spirit out of people, I, I caught a few winks during the show. There were some winks thrown out during the show when I saw it on Tuesday. There was the come together gesture that was really engulfing everyone. And then, of course, at some point, um, I believe it was Ephraim, he threw a handkerchief out. And I'm like, oh, snap, let me, yeah. <laughs> let me grab Did you get it? the Did you get handkerchief. It? Um, how important is audience participation? It's so important. Yeah. yeah, it definitely makes the experience, you know, a lot better um, for us. Yeah, I think, I, go ahead. I'll go. We we had the um, it, it, we were very fortunate. It feels fortunate now because we didn't make it to Broadway, but we had to go out of town and we went to a bunch of different cities to just kind of mold and figure out what the show was. Mm -hmm. So there was a point in the process where you had to go like, okay. Um, how can I how can I use these shows? You know, because this you know we're not in New York, we're not there yet, and we need to make show we need to make sure this show is the best that it can be. So we are very aware of the audience, and we have to be. I feel like that is the the final character that is added to your production, mm -hmm. and it's sometimes the most important character right. to you know the production, just to hear where they're listening and you know and allow them in to your story. You know, because we're in the rehearsal space doing our version of what we mm -hmm. think is the show. Right. Hold for a applause and continue but like sometimes the spirit moves and people respond and don't know why or how but we have to leave room for that mm -hmm. so that's the cool thing is every night um, we are open you know to whatever they're they're ready to say yeah. or feel or be a part of sometimes we have loud exuberant audiences that are yelling at us and we're looking at each other like I wish I could hear my line you know? <laughs> but we, and we love that you know yeah. and then sometimes we have quiet ones where we're like do we need to check a pulse you right. know like right. you know but we love them as well because usually <laughs> the, it's this we get to this the, the end of the the show and everyone is Same on their action. feet and it's so excited yeah. you know and some people can kind of coddle that energy till the end and some people just have to shout amen and 
and be reaching for the handkerchief, mm -hmm. you know, because again, it, it's this music that they've lived, that they know, um, you know, and I think there is this element that it is a concert for them. They're, they get to relive these songs and we have, you know, performances like Get Ready, which are big numbers where it feels like, you know, a, um, big, a big, big concert, a Temptations yeah. concert, but there's just so much heart and so much story in it. So, you know, for the people that knew the Temptations, they get to know them in a deeper, intimate way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just so, so incredibly special to kind of look out in the audience and, you know, see the older couple with <clears throat> tears in their eyes and you just know that they're going through something totally different than the young black kid who's kind of on the edge of his seat seeing himself represented. Absolutely. You know, and to have those those two stories in the same room, um, you know, experiencing this beautiful, you know, piece is just really, really cool. Yeah, I definitely felt transported when I when I saw the show. I, I was instantly drawn in from the first number. Um, I want to talk a little bit about logistics, just, just a small portion. Um, the microphone situation. So at some point, or throughout the show, there was a mini mic that you guys would pull out of your jacket <laughs> pocket. Yes. And I was wondering to myself, wow, is that part of, was that something that you all came up with? Or was that something that would happen in real life during the performances? I mean, I think I mean, you should ask things. Right? Yeah, it doesn't serve you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, our director and our forever. choreographer. One thing I will say, I, I will kind of talk about, and I know Ephraim would talk about it here, is you know we had uh, we were blessed to have Otis Williams, the last original member, founding member of the Temptations, uh, with us on this journey. So he had seen like a workshop, and it was our first day of rehearsal. We were kind of all together, and he came back and he was talking to Ephraim, who played David Rupp, and he said, "If you really want to get David down." He used to, when he'd really want to get the audience, you know, wild up and on their feet, he would take a mic, throw it in the air, and then drop in a split. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there were a lot of splits. And there was a, there, you know, so that's that's kind of the task that he gave uh, uh, Ephraim. But Ephraim <laughs> is is fearless and right. was like, oh yeah, I got you. Baby you know baby. what I mean? Right. Oh, come back tomorrow. <laughs> right, you know I mean? right, right, right. Um, and you know that is something that he does every night. You know, he he, he like he he's he's talked about in the interviews of how he has to trust and kind of surrender, you know, because it's terrifying to just throw something up and go, okay, gravity have my back today, you know? Right. Um, and there's been shows where he's dropped it and he's got another one right outside of right. his pocket and the audience <laughs> still goes crazy, you know? Like, you know? But it, it's, just, it's just so cool. So that is something that they used to do that David would do is he would just take that mic up, throw it up, drop into a split, yeah. you know? Um, but this idea of, you know, in the choreography that we all kind of have mics just everywhere, just who's singing what and how they're doing that was our, you know, director and our choreographer, Sergio. Yeah, and Des is really good and Sergio they're very good at um, transitions right yeah. and so to make everything smooth sometimes you have to tuck things away so that you don't have to say okay now I need to go off and get a mic right to you know if it's just right here the, the moment is not the energy isn't interrupted do you know what I mean uh, James wears a flask uh, in act two in his vest that he has to pull out and he, he's had that flask at the top of the song, mm -hmm. um, but th we don't use the flask for minutes, minutes, and minutes later. So there's nowhere he can store it besides on his body right. to keep the transition going smoothly yeah. so that the scenes always go from moment to moment to moment. And so he'll have a mic on him. He'll pass one to, uh, to Ephraim or Ephraim will have one. Pass just it to me. To, yeah, yeah, yeah to, to make sure that everything stays smooth. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, this show is like a memory play. So a lot of times people are sliding in and sliding out and it's always a movement to our show. Right. And so in order in order to keep that movement going, we have to store things, you know, and extra ones just in case something like just in case someone, <laughs> someone drops happens. one. There's one here to keep it going. Right. Um, and so yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't have to hide anything. Thank Maybe. God. I mean, you have, but you have. He has a lot of costume because he doesn't leave the stage. Sure. Right. So Derek, he won't tell you he doesn't leave the stage. He is the, the last member, so he is you know narrating this memory, if you will. So. Yeah. At the top of show, he is a little a little thicker because he's got <laughs> three scenes underneath him, you know, that you will then see. So we have that, you know, on yeah, top of hiding true. mics. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so speaking of showmanship, um, obviously the timeline of the Temps career overlaps with many of the other groups um, familiar that we all should be familiar with, um, such as the Supremes. Um, who were also very much into being uh, putting on a performance. So let's jump into a video here. Um, Derek? I 
I'm gonna do all the things you could want a man to do. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. I will sacrifice for you while you can do wrong for you. Oh, baby. That's really cool. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit. I, this is what I like to call the, the fun section. I mean, Ooh. we were already having fun, but now we're going we're gonna to unpack some personal stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> not really. <laughs> but um, what's your favorite song to listen to when you're like kind of prepping for that day? Ooh, that's hard because I think we all listen to just different things. It's kind of whatever's in the moment. Sometimes yeah. whatever's coming up on your mm -hmm. shuffle play. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't think I listen to anything specific to get me going. There's always a Janet Jackson song running of through. Of course. Always. I mean, somewhere. always. Always. <laughs> That's my girl. That's my girl. That's my girl. The meet a joke. <laughs> but I don't know. For me, it's uh, Stevie Wonder. Oh. You know, he's my um, my all-time favorite artist. So, I mean, he has a, his catalog is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can always turn to him if I need any kind of inspiration, if I need to get a little bit more, you know, energy that day, or if I need to calm down. It's always a Stevie Wonder song that'll to to get me in the mood for sure. Songs in the key of life specifically. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that, that thing is major. <laughs> It'll always be major. Yeah. Yeah. What um, What's your dream show to book? Theater? Theater-wise, for sure. I mean, this, this, I will not get any better than this show. Okay. There, there, there is, there <laughs> is, I don't believe there will be a show created after this that I will be uh, more excited to do. I've just never, have never been used to this extent of my ability. Mm. And I just don't think any other show that I do after this will ask me to do as much as I'm doing in this show. Mm -hmm. And so this is the dream. Yeah. You know, this is what I will, God willing, will have more uh, theater. I would love to do uh, like a straight play um, yeah. as opposed to a musical yeah. because it's, it's just so <laughs> much easier. <Thinking> <laughs> so like, much I easy. can't like, you know, I can't have any whiskey. <laughs> like, I'm not drinking right now. Uh, I got to really watch what I eat, except for I didn't watch what I ate today. I ate in y'all cafeteria, which is major. <laughs> But like, you know, I just don't I just don't think there is another piece of musical theater that will top this in terms of what it's asking all of us to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, yeah, this is my dream. Yeah, I think yeah. that same, same, same. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also just what this piece is pouring into me yeah. right. for me. I just don't know. I can't see anything else because yeah. I'm just so grateful to be with these guys, with our cast, because it's just, it's providing healing and so much love to me and yeah. giving me so much, you know, just, I don't know, just so much support that I feel like, I don't know, I just feel incredible. So I just don't know what other project would uh, yeah. give me that, would grant me that. that. You know, thing. and specifically with this show, like, 
it's not every day that you see this many black brothers on stage. Sure. Right. So a lot of the times it's between me and him for a role. Mm -hmm. It's between me, you know, like, so the fact that we can all be in the same room right. and that's fine and everyone gets to just be, be great and a star in their own way. I just, I'm like, yeah. this is the dream that I get to look to my brothers and my sisters and be like, oh, we've made it. We're doing something. You're great. I'm great. She's great. They're great. We're great together mm -hmm. um, for the greater good, for a greater calling, you know? I think as a man in this business, this is definitely the dream. Okay. They don't write roles like this for men. Right. Period. In the musical especially, they do not write roles like this for men. Mm -hmm. And then to add on top of that, to write roles like this for black men in oh, theater. For sure. Where we're not playing a thug, we're not playing a slave, we're not playing things that people look and are used to seeing. Mm -hmm. We're playing five intelligent, strong, but also vulnerable men who've lived an incredible life and they've gone through things that everyone understands. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that we're going through that someone's gonna sit and go, well, I, I, I don't understand that because they're a different skin color than I. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, it doesn't happen like this in this show. Right. So to have the opportunity to play something like this, it really is, as Derek said, I, I, I hope that, they, that this is something that shifts in theater, that helps shift theater, and that helps writers go, okay, we can do that. We can yeah. do that in a musical. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait to do a play to bring this type of stuff to the table because this is what it feels like. I've come out of the stage door and people have said, that is one of the best plays I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. It's a musical, mm -hmm. but the work that Dominique Morisot has done in this show, in, uh, also with our director, it feels like a play that just so happens that we're singing and we're dancing. Mm -hmm. right. So it is an incredibly powerful thing that yeah, I hope in the future that there is something else that I get to do that will bring me to the level of this. And not just for myself, for all of us sitting here and for everyone else out there who wants to do this for a living and is doing this for a living. Absolutely. I and think to be able to do that with people you like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the other thing. No, that's, <laughs> that's the, thing. the thing. Because you don't necessarily have to like the people you work with. You just have to work with, work them, with them. Right. Right? And you just have to get the job done. But to do it with, like, I cut up with these guys on stage all the time. I'm the jokester of the, of the group. Yes. And, like, I, I, try to, <laughs> I, try to break, I try to break their character every once so I'll make them laugh. And it never really works, but I try. <laughs> try. Okay. Um, but it's be, I do that because I love them. And I, you know, I, and, but not just I love them, but I really like them. Right. And not just these guys, like the entire cast. Entire the cast. women in our cast are so oh, amazing. Our women are. They Sensation. hold down the cast. They hold us down. The band. Yeah, the band is ridiculous. Oh, They're the top of the top. You know, we recruited the top of the top um, because this music is just so iconic that you can't have just a regular, someone just learned to play violin. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, well, I want to play Tim's music. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, we, we got the best of the best you know, right. supporting us. Um, and so it's just, but we just, we genuinely like each other. That's and cool. that just makes it easy. Mm -hmm. This isn't this for now, for this interview. Yeah. No. This is what it's like. Before we go on stage for our first number, like after we circle up, mm -hmm. the stupidity, it's just, it's I ridiculous. often wonder how much the audience can hear. <laughs> Because right before we go out, sometimes we are laughing. We're still laughing. Like it's still still a second. Into to the have second to of walking out, we are <laughs> yeah. laughing yeah. because of something that has happened. Yeah. And it's an incredible thing to get to do that yeah. with, in, in a show because this we spend, I don't know how it is for you guys here, but we spend almost half of our lives, if not more, at the theater and with these people. So to be able to come into a place where you look forward to seeing yeah. the people that you work with and you look forward to them every day. Because right. you know, if, if nothing else, you're just gonna get this. Right. Mm -hmm. And then to the other perspective, you're gonna get the, I, I have, my stomach has hurt from <laughs> laughing so much. I know the feeling. You yeah. know what I mean? Or you get, and you also get these conversations where we, we sit and we talk. Yeah. We have real talk, and there's no, it's no uncomfortableness. We're able to actually talk to each other about life. I love that. I love that. Um, 
let's jump into some questions. But before we do, I just wanted to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to, to throw their name into the ticket draw um, as we're giving away three tickets to the show. And then you can give me one of those tickets. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I can go again. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a question, there's mics set up on both sides. Go ahead. So obviously, I think like the temptations have appealed to generation after generation. Who do you feel like is the craziest type of audience? Is it the older folks who like this was their music of their youth, or is it people like uh, our age, younger? Uh, older folks. The older yeah. folks. Older folks. <laughs> I, we've had, you know. You it, well, I've had. <laughs> um, <laughs> I come out the stage door and they're screaming, and then you know, one lady grabbed me by. She was an older oh. lady. She grabbed me by my hoodie and pulled me. It's like Melvin, come here. <laughs> and then, and then she pulled me. And she's like, say something in my ear in your deep voice. Say it. Say it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And you know, I play the character, right? I'm not really Melvin, but you know, it's a testament to you know the people that we're playing on stage. Anytime uh, Eddie goes to sing, the women are screaming when when David uh, comes around uh, his yeah. entrance the audience goes wild and you can just hear like they were just like living their like teenage years all over again because you know of the the baseline and just the excitement of David Ruffin coming back and you know everything that's happened like I think we had underwear thrown on stage to us you know it's like <laughs> true experiences it's crazy it's crazy it's 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 like and it is the older crowd because like was it a couple of nights ago where we had this lady who sounded like someone's auntie and she was like well <laughs> hello hello Hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, All that. right. Yeah. It's crazy. We we're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for coming. This was a really great interview. Um, my question is, um, wait, I forgot my question. Oh, I got it. Okay. All right. So this came up a bunch of times in various answers that um, the experience of doing this show, the cast and crew has been like very supportive and like a lot of warmth and stuff. What do you all think, like even going back to auditions, what do you all think accounts for that? Like, why is that? Why is it like that? I think it starts from the top. <laughs> and that is with our producers. They have so much love for this project, uh, Tom Holson and Ira Pedelman. They're here. They're here. Uh, they are here, actually, <laughs> in the back. They have so much love for this project. They have been wanting to put this together for the longest time. When that love starts at the top, it trickles down. Mm -hmm. the, all the people that have been brought on board, they all have this love of what I have said about when people have asked me about what the rehearsal process has been like. And I was like, we all have, we've all done enough stuff as performers, as producers, as directors, as choreographers, et cetera, et cetera, to have some sort of ego. And you need an ego to survive in the world. You need an ego to survive in this business. Mm -hmm. But what I have loved about this process is that ego is put to the side. Everyone's focus is on this show and where it needs to get to. You know, so that's why the experience has been so supportive. Everyone's heart is in the same place. Yeah. We're here to serve the peace. <laughs> I think that's the common goal, you know, is to tell the story truthfully in a way, and that's with all 19 of us um, collectively just coming, making sure that we tell a story that's authentic, that's, you know, heartwarming, that, that gives back as much as it's given to us. Thank you. Thanks. I think. That is two it. questions. We got two questions. Maybe one more. I have Come on now. You want to go again? Yeah, is that okay? Go ahead. Um, so this show obviously is using pre-existing music. Is it hard to make these songs that already exist tell the story that you're trying to tell with the show? Absolutely not. No, I think I think what I did is when I first got the script and I was auditioning, um, I sat down and I just read the script and played the songs kind of as it went along. I think it, we're fortunate that we know some of these songs and it's not like music that we have to introduce to you and you, you know, so a lot of the times, um, and I think Dominique um, did just such a brilliant job of using it to storytell, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, the piece and to push the piece forward and what, you know, she's trying to get across, you know, the. Um, to, to the audience. So I think it, it hasn't been hard. And I also think like there was never pressure. People have asked me like, do you have pressure to like imitate, you know, the sound or these these icons that you're playing? And 
I don't think any of us had that pressure because we knew that there was a piece of Eddie, there was a piece of Paul within us, and it was just us being open to the process to allow that to come out. And I don't think you, at the time, knew. I didn't know how similar my voice was or my essence was to Eddie. I never was thinking, that is a person I want to play. But I'm so grateful that I'm able to portray him mm -hmm. and bring him back for a night, you know, for, for the audiences. Um, you know, so I think just we were, you know, in the rehearsal process, it was kind of like, bring yourself to the piece, you, right. know, you know, be used in that way. And then somehow the audience response is, you were just like Eddie, or you were just like Otis. And like, Derek doesn't necessarily look like a carbon copy of Otis, but his heart, his intentions, you know, they're, they're, so, they're so grounded that they remind you, they bring you back to being in the room or in the presence of Otis Williams. So that's just been really fun. And the lyrical components of their music, again, their music is timeless. You know what I mean? So a song, <clears throat> segregation, determination, demonstration, integration, aggravation, humiliation, obligation to our nation. Someone could have written those words today for a song, but that's Ball of Confusion, which was written in the 70s. It's not, it's not that difficult with music, with a catalog like they have. I think they, uh, you first, I, 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 and putting words in our, to our playwright's mouth, but you have to first figure out what story you want to tell, right? So uh, I think her and Des and also Time and Ira um, probably sat around a table and said, okay, now, you know, there's a lot of stories you can tell about the temptations. Um, how do we want to tell it and what is it that we actually want to tell? Right? And so once they figured that out, okay, now what songs uh, are relevant to those stories and how can we put them, how can we sequence them so that we keep the story moving forward? And uh, you know, there was a time where we had one song uh, in the show uh, right before the title song, which is Ain't Too Proud, we had another song um, and we sang those songs back to back. Uh, and then they're like, well, we don't necessarily need that song because it's not necessarily forwarding the story. So let's get rid of this song. And that was my favorite song. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, I, I think they figured out you know, the story they wanted to tell, um, and then they picked the songs based on the story. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, Papa was a Rolling Stone, and, they, and we use that phrase in a couple of different ways, you know. I have a son in my particular, uh, in, in the show. And so we use that to reference actually my son. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, they did a really, really good job of making the literal, the lyrics, like literal to our story. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, in this show, you, you portray people uh, real people, um, for some of you, people who you met in real life. How is the process of, of working on that role different than, than made up characters? Is there a difference? Well, my, my person is the only one that's still living. Mm -hmm. um, and we all met him. We call him Uncle O. He's an uncle. Uh, uh, very affectionately, we call him Uncle O. And um, I think he was the window or the doorway for all of us to get to know all of our particular characters because he knows them intimately. I got to know him specifically, um, but you know, there's no better person to hear from than someone's best friend or someone's brother about, you know, he can tell you stories about Eddie, about, you know, Paul, about Melvin, about David that you won't hear in an autobiography. Um, and so uh, I can't really speak for them. Um, they um, <laughs> you no, all I mean, can do that, but yeah. like, you know, uh, talking with him, there's just no greater source, there's no greater wealth of information than to actually speak to the guy you're portraying. There's, I can read a million books and it still won't be enough to having one sit down with him for five to 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you guys again for coming. Let's give another so round of applause. Good, <laughs>